Greetings. This is the 1913 Project. My name is Ben Prather, and today for this episode, what we're going to be looking at is um, what were the motivating factors that led to uh, Woodrow Wilson implementing his policies and the wave of support that he wrote um, in, in thanks to these policies. Um, I, I want to look at what the intentions were, what the problems were that were on people's minds that needed fixing, that needed to be addressed, that these policies were aiming to fix. Because oftentimes what we find is that the that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So I want to take a moment to actually consider what were the intentions and not just assume that you know these were malicious historical figures that uh, I'm going to demonize, but no, but to actually humanize them by actually showing that no, they, they did have good intentions and, and, and their motives were, were, were not malicious. So I want to take some time to really develop those ideas of what it was that motivated them. So the first motivation that I want to look at uh, today is the abuses of the industrialists, because that was one of the main things that really that the media used and the, the elites used to really get support for these ideas and to build up the groundswell of support that produced this wave. Um, and uh, so basically the idea was there were these huge monopolistic companies, particularly in steel and the railroads, um, that uh, the likes of Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, Edison, Ford, these huge titans of industry that really did, they helped build our country, but they did so um, at the cost of living conditions of their of their workers. And uh, it was these abuses, the catastrophes that happened fairly regularly, um, causing the death, loss of limbs, injury of workers, oftentimes dozens in one incident, yeah, so basically, uh, after the Civil War, the federal government was bankrupt and had no money. So even if they had the will to challenge these companies, they did not have, the companies had more money to spend than the federal government did um, to defend themselves from any, any type of regulation or investigation that Congress would do. And uh, so, they, so even if they had the will to, to go after these companies, they did not have the funding to be able to make anything happen. So in a lot of communities, these monopolies were the primary job in town. There were some other jobs around the town, such as maybe the restaurants where the employers would work or a community store where the workers could get goods and stuff that perhaps aren't there locally so they could order something out and they would come to the community store where they could pick it up. And, um, and so, but oftentimes there would be one main thing, uh, mining company or a manufacturing company that provided most of the jobs for that area and the rest of it was just subsidiary jobs that really depended on that main company there. And so what happens then is, is that the workers there don't really have any other places to go. They're stuck at that job because they, they really don't have anywhere to go. And even if they were to decide that I'm going to up and go to some other town and get some other similar type of um, laborer type job, then uh, the conditions there are going to be just as bad as where they are because this was systemic at that time. So there really were no options to go um, for people to get a better condition. So with no other options, then the, then the uh, manufacturers could keep the working conditions poor, keep the working conditions, keep the pay low, and then basically not have to worry about it. And then any times there, there would be a revolt or anything, um, they could just replace the workers with, with new workers a lot of times. So uh, if you did revolt, you risk the, the possibility that you would lose your job. And then on the national scale, because a lot of these companies had um, 80, 90 percent of the national market share, they could set the prices wherever they want. And so then with the high prices and the low wages and, and production costs, um, there was a large gap there that they could use to either line their pockets or also they could line the pockets of the, of the government officials to get regulations passed that they want, um, whether it's something that makes things easier for them or something that makes it harder for an upstart to get started. Um, and they also could 
line the pockets of investigators. So maybe they look the other way when there are complaints made about stuff that they're doing that perhaps should not be done. Or if you have a competitor that's going, maybe you could line the pockets of investigators to make something happen that they then have to fight off those claims um, when really there's nothing there. But by fighting off those claims, it keeps them from being able to get their balance and get started. Um, so those were the type of dynamics that the that the minor that where the money of these monopolies was going to be able to maintain the monopoly structure and prevent an actual capitalistic open market from happening. So the next thing I want to look at is that there was an obsolete banking system. So basically, the banking system that existed at that time was built by and for an egalitarian society that basically was just lived a sustenance living, make what we need to be able to eat and build a shelter and then party on the weekends. And like that was all that you had and that's all that you needed. And so that's all that you produced. And that was the, and the banking system was just enough to support that. Uh, but with these large industrial manufacturing sites coming up, um, that produced a lot of wealth. And this new wealth that was produced um, wanted a banking system that was built by and for their needs. And so, um, and because they have the money, they could afford to uh, implement a new banking system. And so um, one way or another, there is going to be a new banking system uh, built by and for the, um, the manufacturing needs as opposed to the, to replace the one that had existed that was by and for the um, for the egalitarian society, and um, essentially in that egalitarian society, there was kind of a, an upper class and lower class, and like the so the banks went to basically the nobility class that existed before that, especially even if you look at Europe um, and like the old feudal system. So it went to like the feudal lord type of people. Um, and so these large industrialists, you know, they didn't want their money going to a bank that was going to those people. So they said, we got the money, we can make a new bank. And then the profits from the bank will go to us and cut out the old elite uh, from that piece of the pie. So the next motivating factor that I want to look at is that the government had largely become highly dysfunctional. Um, the Senate seats were oftentimes, so they were at that point, they were appointed by the state legislatures. And in the states where it was close, where the parties were evenly balanced, what would happen is uh, both parties would obstruct the nominations of the other so that nobody could get nominated. And then because appointing senators is a constitutional responsibility, that has, re that has priority over any other actions that the state legislators want wanted to do in their legislation. So they would get bogged down in just sometimes years, seats would go vacant and the state legislature would would grind to a halt, not even being able to get the routine business that's need to be done by the legislature done because they're just always bogged down in these Senate appointments and appointing for vacancies. Getting business done at the state legislature became almost impossible until uh, the Senate seats could be filled and the Senate seats could stay vacant for years as impasses came up. Uh, another thing is um, because they couldn't get the routine business done, one of the routine things that the states had to do was pass a spending bill um, to pay their share of taxes to the federal government because the federal government didn't have the ability to directly tax the citizens. What they would do is they would uh, tax each state based on their population, and then the states would have to pay that to the federal government. And and so the federal government was dependent on the states collecting the taxes and bringing them and giving it back to the federal government. But uh, the states were unable to pass the bills, to the spending bills to do that. So then the federal government was not getting those tax revenues. And on top of that, um, it was common for states at that time to protest uh, federal spending and federal policies by uh, withholding their taxes and just refusing to sign the appropriations bill to pay it. And in a lot of the rural states, um, the revenue just wasn't there to cover their share of tax because it was not based on um, 
differences in revenue, it was based on the total number of people. Each person in your state, for each person in your state, you owed this amount of taxes. And so those are some of the dysfunctional government issues that were happening at that time. So the last thing I want to look at is the role of the intellectual elite and their media partners who are promoting their ideas and pushing their ideas that were coming out of these elite institutions such as Princeton University, where Woodrow Wilson was the president of Princeton University as when he decided to run for president. Um, he had a library named after him at Princeton University, their main library on campus, that was recently renamed, but I'll leave that up to you to in research why that was. Um, but basically, um, at that point, you know, capitalism was looking a little bit passe, and there were these philosophers, particularly European philosophers, um, and in particular Karl Marx and Nietzsche, who were coming up with these ideas for... Um, economic and political systems that could replace capitalism um, as we develop a new industrial scale government they they pictured uh, replacing the egalitarian scale capitalist system and uh, and yeah so these ideas are you know they're very idealistic when you read them they sound like you know they sound all shiny and and interesting and compelling and uh, in 1913, there were no examples of what could go wrong if you try implementing these policies. Today, um, you can address some of these ideologies and philosophies by pointing out the failures of communist Russia under Stalin or communist China under Mao or um, Germany under the National Socialist Workers Party of the 30s and 40s. And... Uh, so we can point out these failures of these philosophies, uh, but in 1913, they didn't have that. All that they had was the shiny new, uh, let's give this a try. And, um, and so there was a push by the elite to do this, and, uh, and, and the media was complicit in this at the time. And, uh, and uh, really, one of the main obstacles to just getting this through was... Um, the Senate, actually, um, because the rural states had a large say, have a large say in the Senate, um, it was hard for, and, and the rural er, uh, areas were seeing this as a impingement from the larger cities, so they opposed it. So, um, so the Senate was an obstacle because the media had uh, indoctrinated the masses. These had broad appeal. Uh, even though the ruling classes tended to oppose them in these smaller rural areas. Um, so, yeah, that was some of the intellectual elite motivation for um, the wave that led to Woodrow Wilson. So in conclusion, uh, there were actual real problems that the people of that time were facing that needed to be addressed, needed to be fixed. Um, so... What we're going to be looking at as we go on in the, in the next episode is what were the changes that were implemented before going in and seeing how they have gone wrong. And then, um, yeah, because it's, you know, from our perspective, we can look back historically and see, you know, how these things can go wrong and how they might go wrong and um, evidence that they did go wrong. But when you're in the moment, you know, Hindsight is twenty twenty, but when you're in the moment, it's a lot harder to um, picture the unintended consequences of the decisions you're making, oftentimes with the best intentions. So thank you for listening uh, to this episode of the 1913 Project. Uh, feel free to, I invite you to join my community at the 1913project.locals.com. Uh, or to watch this and other videos that I have at the Ultra Crepidarian. And thank you for your time. And I look forward to uh, engaging with you at the 1913project.locals.com. So what would happen is that um, why can't I speak? Okay.